to Take a Man podcast from Odyssey Sports. That's Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And uh, the end of the season, Logan, people start to be uh, a little more forthcoming with, with their answers uh, on certain topics. And uh, Jahan Dotson was asked yesterday by Scott Abraham about the culture in the commander's locker room. And here's how that went. You're in between the lines. What do you think this team needs going forward next year to kind of get more wins, get over the hump? Um, I would say as far as players, just a, a sense of culture. Um, you know, just we, we got to have a mindset in here that we we want change. Uh, we we can't we can't just accept this this type of stuff because this is really hard on a lot of people. Um, and I know a lot of people come from winning backgrounds, uh, so we we got to bring that stuff in here. We we can't accept anything but winning honestly um and that, that starts with us players um no matter who the coaches are uh yeah it starts with us uh, we we gotta bring our best foot um and make sure that we go out every sunday and, and bring it when you say culture is that is that on the players or do, do the coaches feed into that um i, I feel like it, it's everyone but you know it, i feel like the best teams uh that you see in any sport are player led um they, your, your captains they, they step up um, and everyone really follows because when you when you're surrounded by by guys who are hungry and want to win, you know it it trickles down. Uh, it's a domino effect. So I feel like that, that's where we we can start. That audio, courtesy of ABC Seven, um, Logan. You hear that? I, I certainly have a lot of thoughts. Shared some of them on the radio already, uh, but I, you know, we'll, we'll rehash some of what I think here. But first, I'd, I'd be curious what you think when you hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's one of those uh, comments where it's, I think he's trying to take a personal accountability. You know, he's kind of saying it's on the players and a good player will do that. Um, but I think obviously Scott and the rest of the media is like drawing maybe a correlation to some other things, other factors when it comes to leadership and building a culture. Um, and what I will say is like culture is a funny word. It's like so ambiguous and it's very hard to kind of define. I think, you know, Jahan alluded to like perhaps you know, developing a winning culture, for, you know, and I think like I've been a part of teams that have been led in both ways. Um, obviously, the teams in 2010, 11, 12, I think were very player led teams. Obviously, you had one of the most dynamic leaders that I, I that I ever played with in London Fletcher. And I think Mike deserves a lot of credit for kind of empowering the right people and encouraging that type of leadership, obviously. And, and Fletch was was fantastic. And it was an older team. And the, all those older guys were, were really good pros. They set good examples for the young guys. You know, you know, Lorenzo Alexander, obviously, Kedrick Golson, Reed Dowdy, really high character guys, really high character locker room that could tolerate, um, you know, that, that would not tolerate certain things. And as a result, like, I, I think that's that would, I would characterize that as a team that was very player led and player driven. Then I go to a team like Atlanta, where Dan Quinn had developed this tremendous culture in the building and this tremendous um, you know, kind of work environment that was awesome. But then the player, the continuity of the players was a very young team. They didn't have a lot of maturity. And the older players at the time, you know, Matt Ryan, while being a very dynamic leader offensively, I was having a hard time relating to the younger population at that point in his career. So obviously, <clears throat> I think people want to say, oh, it's, it's the players, it's the coaches, but it's really the dynamic between the two. And I think it's crazy in the NFL how dramatically that can change you know, in, in year to year, because like the, the roster turnover is so crazy. So I think, you know, I think people are going to make a lot of this soundbite. And I kind of understand why to a certain extent. But I think that ultimately, um, I agree with what he's saying. Like, this is a player thing. Like, and when you look at this situation specifically, like, you know, we don't know if it's for sure, we all anticipate big changes in terms of coaching staff. But players are kind of the lifeblood of the organization, especially players like John and Duran. Players are going to be here for a long time. So their leadership is going to be um, extremely important. I, I don't think Jahan's being critical of them necessarily, but I do think he's calling attention to something that um, he'd like to see change. Yeah, I mean, I do, th I do think it's interesting when he mentioned specifically the captains. And I just, I don't know the relationship between he and Terry, or, and I, Terry is obviously in his room. Um, so the relationship there is going to be, more important for him as a fellow wide receiver but obviously john is kind of one of the key voices if not the key voice in the room and i when you talk about that relationship between players and coaches one of the things that i wonder about and this is i i'm gonna be very clear here there are times that i know things and i wink nod and i'm like i wonder hey hey i don't know anything here this is me purely speculating just kind of watching what has happened 
um, and, and not even speculating, me truly like wondering. Like, John is a guy that I remember after his rookie year, his, the way he answered questions at the end on like locker clean out day. I remember going on the junkies the day after going, I don't care what they do this off season. If they don't put a C on that guy's chest, they've made a mistake. Like mm. he is so important with how he thinks about the game and winning and all this kind of stuff. Still pretty fresh off Nick Saban school and, and all of that. And you watch how Chase and Montez, but really Chase emerged as a very loud voice mm. in the same room and not necessarily always in a constructive way. And I just wonder if John kind of felt like sick of it and neutered to a, an extent. And that undercut his voice as someone who was trying to lead in a certain direction. And maybe there was some tension pulling in opposite directions. And that can happen within a locker room. And sometimes it can be healthy, but obviously in this particular case, uh, it hasn't, it certainly hasn't been healthy enough to produce wins. Uh, it doesn't feel like based off the comments coming out and some of the things that we've heard that, that the, the culture is great uh, in that locker room. And I do wonder, you know, being a little hands off uh, or perhaps two hands off. If you're Ron, did you allow the wrong voices? Cause you, you talk about how Mike did a really good job of, of making sure that Fletch was the guy that was heard. And so the, the way I would look at it on a big picture scale is this. I think that you need to have the illusion of being player led. It's actually not. It's really, it starts at the very top of the organization of having a clear vision for what you want empowering the right people and if you don't have them bringing in the right people and then making sure that the standard is set to a point that they're enforcing your standard and so maybe as a coach or an executive you don't have to be the enforcer of the culture but you need to, you do need to set it and i don't know that that was done particularly well over the four years that ron was here um and there could be a variety of reasons from disharmony on the coaching staff itself uh, and, and some lack of continuity and, and lack of communication, which we've talked about in the past, different visions. Um, and it could be big things or little things, different visions of like, it seemed like Ron and Scott had different visions of the offense. And this year, the, the coordinator they bring in didn't really seem to match the way they built the team. And so there's these points of friction that makes it really hard for players to even understand what they want the culture to be and what they want the kind of messaging and thought processes to be in the first place. And so, again, I go back to that phrase, like the illusion of player-led, but it's actually because they're just enforcing something where everyone's all on the same page from top to bottom of the organization. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, I mean, obviously in this situation, I don't disagree with the way you characterize that. There does seem to be a little bit of, um, you know, uh, yeah, friction's a good word between kind of the vision of per certain members of the staff and the, you know, I've had conversations where it's like, oh, you know, this person wasn't coaching this the way we wanted it to be coached and blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and that, that does, that does affect the, the ability for the players to play good football. And I ultimately think it's important to note that like good culture and winning culture, like they're, they're really closely c connected. Right. So I think back to like the, the, the Dan Quinn example. And like I said, he's got a great culture. It was awesome to come to work, really enjoyed the environment there. Right. But they weren't winning and it really negatively impacted the buy-in to that right right so i think like even um you know even with with mike for example like obviously like you know 2012 the culture's great everything's awesome and then <laughs> 13 it's the one that ends in kyle <laughs> throwing the ball 70 times at the end right. of the season and so i think like as much as you want to say like it's it's this one thing or this one relationship or whatever like not winning football games is a big part of it, right? Because Ron might be have the like, you know, I've heard recently that guys are really stoked on Ron being the defensive coordinator. They just like his energy. They like the vibe that he's bringing in. And that's cool to hear. But, you know, that's like not a sustainable thing necessarily if you're losing a bunch of games because people say, well, it's not, it doesn't, it's not positively affecting the outcome of anything. So you get a lot, a lot of guys who don't buy in. Um, and so I think I, so back to the main point, it's like, I don't think it's, I don't think there's an illusion of player led teams. I think there are player led teams. I think there are coaches that are courageous enough to let that happen and you have to have the right team for it. Right. And I yeah. think like, um, you know, like one thing about this team that I've, I've said a bunch is they don't, and this is maybe new CBA issues that you're going to have to deal with when you're constructing a roster is there's no like middle class of the roster anymore. There's not that like seven, eight year vet that's hanging around on like a, you know, five million for three year type of contract that's been around that knows how to be a pro that can provide some kind of foundational support for the rest of the roster. It's like you have old dudes, 
you have young dudes and you have way more young dudes than you have old dudes. So the leadership dynamic in the locker room is drastically different, I think. And I think that's something that needs to be acknowledged. And every team is going through it at the NFL. But I look like the Baltimore Ravens, for example, and they've done a good job of kind of saying, and I don't know how they've done this through their GM and through their probably their vision, their their team vision. You always talk about team vision in soccer and stuff like that, of prioritizing certain guys in leadership roles that are veterans, that are, you know, like Picard for them. Like they could have easily let Picard walk this offseason, but they've right. kept him around. He's a culture piece for them. The linebackers, right? Culture pieces. And so I think that's that's something that those are decisions that are made, right? And so like who are the culture pieces here? Because you can't just have two guys with captains on their chest and be like, that. those are our culture pieces. It's like in the example of the 2012 team, which is, again, was one of the best team-led, you know, player-led teams I've ever been on. Obviously, you had Fletch, who's like the guy, right? But right. then you had all of these kind of offensive, you had all these guys that were like in the middle, guys that you, that were going to do the extra stuff. Like I mentioned Zoe, Kedrick, um, the offensive line guys like Will Montgomery, Corey Lichtensteiger, those guys were great because they held a standard not only in their own room, but like for the offense. You said, oh, those are the guys that are pros, pros. And so I look at this team and I'm kind of like, do they have anybody that is not the top, not the bottom, but the middle? And so like, again, when we're talking about, you, you mentioned the coaching staff. I also think in terms of roster construction, there's a little bit of an issue here in terms of right. kind of saying, what is our culture and who are the guys that have been around long enough to kind of embody and embrace that culture and then teach that culture to the new guys coming in so that's why this is such a complicated thing and i think it's 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 even more of an issue quite honestly when you're not winning football games because i've been a part of teams with bad cultures like bad standards but you're winning games like at some point in the year and everything's great everything's awesome you're like oh well we're gonna be good it ends up being a losing culture long term right but it's fine while you're winning i guess is what i'm saying no, totally. Um, and there, there's a hundred percent that where like, if you win, it just covers up a lot of stuff. And there's been teams that I've covered where you just look around and you go, man, if this thing goes sideways, it's going to be bad. Like it's going to blow up in a bad way. Cause they're, they're winning right. for other reasons right, right now, but you also do occasionally have teams that really do stick together through the, the crap of a season or they, they look at it and they're like, we're just not doing what we need to do. Or like we've had bad injury luck or just schedules really hard. And, but like, we still believe we have what we need in the locker room. And I think there was some of that to, to an extent for part of this season, but I think that is, that is long gone. Um, there, there's a couple of things you said there that I think are interesting that also play back to Jahan's, uh, Jahan's quote. And, and the, the biggest one I think is the willingness to change. And I wonder how much that is a direct callback to some of the friction with Eric earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. And, Maybe. you know, like the willingness to be open to doing things differently. And this is where winning also matters because you talk about buy-in, like the, these things mesh, you know, causation correlation 100%, where if you do something new, if you ask people to do something new and it works, they'll continue to do it. And if it doesn't work, then they're going to be like, why are we changing all this stuff? Why are you upsetting the way I do things? Why are you making things harder? Why am I grinding this much more? Why am I this, that, the other thing when it, there's no payoff? And in fact, this season has been worse than any of the others that they've had in the last four years. This is the worst season of Rivera's tenure. And so if, if guys had questions coming in, I think there's, there's both on the player side, like to Jahan's point, are guys willing to do what it takes? Are they willing to learn from an Eric Bieniemy who's been there? You talk about like that middle management level, if you will, from a guy like Andrew Wiley. And I, I know that Wiley is not is the opposite of a fan favorite. He's had his struggles at times this year, but like he played on a Super Bowl winner. Right. So if he comes in and is like, "Hey guys, this is how we need to be doing this. We need to do these extra things, or watch this extra film, or whatever." Are people willing to listen to someone like an Andrew Wiley who's coming in from the outside and also does make key mistakes at, at big points in games? And it's like, why would I listen to you? Like, you just got Sam hit from his blind side or, you know, hit in his face. Um, so I, I think that there is that element, too, of the willingness from the players. But then the other side of this, if I'm going to look at it from the coaching side, is do you, as a coach, meet people where they are? And I don't know that Eric specifically is that kind of guy. Eric has we a very set way of doing know. things. We don't know. We, yeah. we, there's there's rumors and things, but just to be clear. Well, like I'm just we saying, don't. like, he's he is a guy that is like, 
he, he said this. Like, this is yeah, not. I know, but I'm just, not saying, me, but like, I'm just saying, like, we don't, we're not in the meeting room is what I'm saying. Right. Just for people listening. Yeah, no, we're not we're not in the meeting room for sure. But it's like if Eric is like my way or the highway, and this is the way we do things, this is the way that I do things, and I know it works, and you're not willing to meet guys where they are and bring them to where you want to go, that's not gonna work either. Yeah. And so it's not that Eric is wrong about the way that he wants to do things. It's just that it's it's getting the guys to come along with you. Did he do the things he needed to do to build those bridges, knowing that you had guys coming from a different way of doing things that ha might have some different thoughts and some of whom who had been very successful in their careers, presumably, um, you know, so we, we just, we don't know, but those are the kind of things that I think, you know, if you're doing the, the dissection, like those are the questions you'd want to answer. Yeah, 100%. And I, I also think like leadership and culture, like it, there's such a psychology element to it. Like, you know, yeah. I do the high school football coaching thing and we had like a very interesting season, you know, where, it's you know the head coach had to step away for a little bit and then when he came back like and they're high school kids but in some ways it like magnifies leadership it magnifies culture in a way that i thought i think is very unique because in the nfl and in college college not so much but in the nfl for sure there's like a professionalism that hides some of the cultural deficiencies right because everyone is kind of like i'm a private contractor i have to do the best for myself and there's this external and internal motivation. They're like this very type A people most of the time. So it, I think it covers up a lot of cultural deficiencies. Like when you're in the locker room, like you won't be able to tell, but in high school, I think it's more, they wear it on their sleeve a little bit more. And so what I was going to say is like when the coach came back, like we were running this essentially the same, everything was the same. When he came back, there was like an uptick in players, right? Because they just believed in what this guy was doing a little bit more. And so I think like that's something else about um, just culture that is so ambiguous and why there's a million books written about it right it's because there's no perfect formula and there's no like this is the definitively the right way to do it but i think it's like to kind of to your point like there is a a way to maximize the 53 dudes on the team that is different for each team right yeah like what works in you know what works in new england like if he came here like next next week and said this is and just there was no change or no like transition turn. yes yeah. correct um that would be really challenging i think you get a lot of pushback from him you know in terms of what bill belichick and his leadership style and the culture that he is purported to have in new england so i do think there's a lot of that about kind of finding the right mix for what your players need for what your team needs and it's different for everybody like we just talked about this team and the construction and all these different things so um, i think that's one of the things that makes it really hard and it makes it especially hard when you're not winning football games it makes it really really hard to kind of keep any kind of cultural identity any type of cultural vision and you've pointed out some of the things you know like position coaches like i think back to the sam mills thing you know like and that was obviously something where he's not coaching it the way that jack wants it to be coached and that you know undermines that room and sets that room back for a couple of years and makes that room kind of like you said, like you alluded to maybe the fact that John is frustrated by Chase and because Chase isn't doing what Sam wants or what Jack wants and there's no accountability. And obviously, so it's, it, I think there's a lot of things with this team with regards to culture, but I just wanted to point out that like, there's no, there's no magic formula. Like the new guy coming in, right. like is not going to be able to be like this, this is the road to good culture. You'll have to come in evaluate the team and be like these are some things i think we could do differently from a cultural standpoint and uh i think that's the thing about this that's so th th about jahan's comments specifically that are so interesting because he's not wrong to say it's a player thing and you're not wrong to insinuate that it's a coach's thing because every team like i alluded to like when i was talking about my career is different and the the mixture of getting that done is hard and i think having a a coach and a team and, and leaders on the team, a, a leadership in the coaching room and a coaches on the or leaders on the team that understand that it's different it, is what makes, what makes a good culture. And it's really hard yeah. to find people like that. To be clear about what I'm saying, <clears throat> I'm not saying it's, it's a coach thing versus a player thing. I'm saying no, it's a cohesion know. thing. No. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 think yeah. We're saying I, I know, thing. I know you, it's, you get what I'm saying just to be clear for the audience. Like it is a cohesion thing. It is. Can you get everybody on the same page? And I think like, for instance, to go back to the John example, like did John all of a sudden become a bad leader? No, I think John got sick of some stuff and he's a human being. Right. And so maybe his leadership fell off this year because he was just tired of seeing some of the other people get away with stuff that in the winning culture that he was used to at Alabama, 
right? That's his example. That's his version of, of what this winning culture looks like, which Nick Saban runs the tightest of ships, a, 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 a version, by the way, that would not really work probably very well in the NFL because all of a sudden the, the power structures are different from college to the pros with contracts and grown men with families versus college kids. But like the, the level of looseness um, which Ron has had success with because he could trust guys like Luke Keekley, et cetera, in his right. past. Um, and and, and you know, a little your, bit more. And trust your coordinators too. I think that's the other right. thing is like, that's kind of the, you know, cause I, I, like I said, I think when Ron took over his DC, like there was a, a cultural shift in the defense, yeah. right? Schematic shift and a cultural shift, which again, no, no criticism of, of Jack here necessarily. It was just different, but the guys responded better to it. Right. And I think right. like that's something that um, again, like you were kind of alluding to at the beginning, is like Ron is one piece, but the 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 roots of that tree of the coaching staff are, are really kind of your cultural, you know, propagators here. And I think yeah. that's something else that were those guys in the best positions all the time. I don't know. So yeah, and then the front office side of it too is like, who do you bring in and empower, and like, how much does that matter in your scouting? I know for a fact when the old regime was here that some of the high up personnel, maybe not a Bruce Allen, but like the Kyle Smiths of the world and, and some of the people on that scouting staff really prioritized certain types of guys. And that's right. why John Allen was, was targeted, by the way. Right. It's like, we want this dude to be, as our first round pick, the captain of the football team. Like, was Jame, like I like Jamin's progression as a football player uh, in a lot of ways, but like, I don't think that he was ever drafted with the idea of like, oh, that's going to be the the captain leader of our team and yeah. who you prioritize and what skill sets you prioritize from like the makeup standpoint of who your best players are matters a lot too. And, and I think that's something too about like that 2012 team, for instance, you have the the middle management, if you will, the Lorenzo Alexanders, who's a pro bowler, by the way, um, but on special teams, but like London Fletcher on top of being your, your leader is also one of your best players. Mm -hmm. And that's really important too, is like, do you have, and that's why, like, I think from a Terry and John standpoint, like you're okay. Um, but do you have other people that are willing to follow them? Do you have other people up and down that roster? Do you have that middle level of player? And, you know, are the people that you're bringing in with the hopes of being your best players, the type of leadership character guys that are going to make your football team maximized. And I, and I don't know that that was always prioritized here, or maybe it was, and they missed on the evaluation because that happens too. Well, I also think it's just like <clears throat> understanding like what you have in the building too. It, it's, it's, and, it, and because of this, there's so much turnover here all the time. Like, you know, yeah. the, the roles aren't defined. There's a COVID year. Ron's got cancer. Like the whole, all that 100%. makes it really hard to have a clear perspective. But I look at like, you know, we talked about Dewan Jones a lot during the draft in the last cycle and there was a lot of character concerns about him. Right. And so I do think it's the team did a good job of saying like, even though he's uber talented, he doesn't fit here. But Cleveland, like, look at the group that they have there. Look at the coach they have there. Like, they can tolerate that because they know that they have the infrastructure to support a player like that. And I think, like, that's something that that self-awareness that you're talking about is really, really hard to come by with, with teams, right? And I think the thing we're going to talk about this more with draft stuff and the importance yep. of meetings at draft day and all those types of things. But the problem with the draft is there's only there's only one John Allen. There's one guy who's a really good football player, who's wired the right way, who's a good leader. Like very rarely do you have a player that has all three of those traits, right? But how much do you want to prioritize like a skilled player and how much can your culture accommodate that guy? I remember with um, with Sean, when Sean was here, they went out and signed to Sean Jackson. And there was that was a guy that Mike probably wouldn't have signed, right? Because Mike would really, really, really valued kind of these blue collar tough guys think like think about the receivers that were here at the time like yeah Pierre, Pierre Garçon yeah. Josh Morgan like Santana Moss like good pros physical dudes and Deshaun just didn't fit that but I remember talking to Sean he was like I think I think our culture can handle him right I think our culture can 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 tolerate that and it was really interesting to watch his you know he's a great player Deshaun and a pretty good teammate to be quite honest like you know, no complaints about him, but it was really interesting to watch him and his addition in conjunction with Jay's leadership style and how that kind of affected the locker room. If right. Mike had, but if Mike had been here still, I'm pretty confident, like he wouldn't have brought him in, but if he had, 
the rest of the team was had such high character that it wouldn't have tolerated some of the stuff that Deshaun was doing, like coming late to practice or missing treatment or whatever. Like, but that was some. But again, like that's how one piece, one change, one difference can totally impact or erode um, erode the culture of a locker room. For sure. We could do go forever on this. Yeah. Uh, there's so many different, I mean, as you said, there's been books written about it, uh, but that's going to do it for today. It's something that we'll talk about when, you know, as the new people come in, yeah. like how do they build it um, through the draft? So we'll be touching on this quite a bit throughout the off season. Uh, and if you want more, my thoughts on it, uh, you can go to my YouTube page at Craig Hoffman, check out my segment uh, from right after uh, when Jahan said this yesterday or uh, on, on Wednesday, whatever day it is now. Anyway, our podcast is over. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at Tap Sports Bar for the final Take Command pregame show of the season on Sunday. For Logan, I'm Craig. Thanks for watching and listening. Take